Okay. Hey guys, I can't hear you. Welcome you everyone to the keynote in AMA with Professor Goldberg. Professor Goldberg is an artist, writer, inventor, and researcher in the field of robotics and automation. He leads the UC Berkeley Automation Sciences Lab, which pursues research in cloud robotics and automation, social information, and algorithmic automation for feeding, fixturing, and grasping, with an emphasis on geometric algorithms that minimize sensing and actuation. On top of that, Mr. Goldberg is also credited with developing the first robot with the web interface. That's crazy. Besides building tech, Professor Goldberg has also edited several books, such as The Robot in the Garden, Telerobotics and Telepistemology in the Age of the Internet, and Beyond Webcams, an Introduction to Online Robotics. Furthermore, his artwork is showcased in a variety of areas, including Pompidou Center in Paris and the Walker Art Center. But now, enough from me. Let's give it up for the person who you're all here for. Mr. Goldberg, take it away. Uh, thank you guys, I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I've got a number of slides I wanna share with you and even some new work that is actually very, very fresh. And we just finished the this week. So let me start out by just introducing myself as, as, as you have, this is a, a, an artist drawing a nice diagram of some of the projects that are going on in the lab and some of my students. And the, our lab is at automation.berkeley.edu. This is the real students who are really the, 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 the great minds, the Jedis, as I call them, behind the projects that I'll talk about. And this is our uh, lab. That's a scene on usually uh, a scene, say, the night before a big deadline. So everybody's working away. And again, I want to just say, if you want to reach me or follow me on Twitter, it's at Ken underscore Goldberg. And that's our lab email address. So big thing on everybody's mind right now is the, the, the pandemic. It's, it's having a resurgence all over the world and it really came out of left field. It's, um, the, the effects are very deeply felt. And one area that is, uh, is affecting robotics is in the huge increase in the use of e-commerce. And again, this is happening worldwide and it's because people are, are essentially staying home and they're shopping, but they're, they're going to their computer. And this, is a, this has been growing over the years. It's a very complex problem. And the, over, the, over the last decade, e-commerce sales have grown, but in the last nine months, they've skyrocketed. It's, it's, some say that the next, this upcoming season is gonna be the Mount Everest of, of e-commerce, where the, the challenge is that there's enormous, huge volumes of demand and a limitations on the ability to supply that demand because there are there the limitations on workers in the warehouses. The, there's a fear about putting workers in close proximity for, for good reason. And now you have to deliver a huge, unprecedented number of packages in without human, I mean, with limited amount of human labor available. So the big companies all over the world, in China, India, in the US are basically trying their best to hire workers. They're hiring 100, this is actually an older number, 200,000 workers have been hired to try and tackle this. But very interestingly, there's a huge new demand for robots. Now, robots are very good at um, some things, but they're, one thing they're very, they're still lacking at is, is dexterity. Humans are remarkably good. So humans are able to pick up almost any object and manipulate it with a, quite a bit of a remarkable amount of dexterity. Now, robots are still very clumsy. And I wanna explain why that is. And here's, a, here's an illustration. If you imagine yourself in the position of being a robot. So imagine that you're asked to clean up after lunch and your, this is how the world looks like to you. All of your sensors are noisy and imprecise. Your actuator, your, your arm and gripper are not perfectly controllable. And you also have uncertainty in your models of the physics and contact between your gripper and objects in the world. So it's not surprising that robots today are still remarkably clumsy. So summarizing this, there's three sources of uncertainty. It's uncertainty in the physics. We don't know the exact frictional properties, the mass properties. 
of objects, how they, where exactly they make contact. We don't know the, our perception is not perfect because it's very hard to perceive the three-dimensional structure of the world precisely. And our control, ability to control our own actuators is slightly imprecise due to errors in joints and gears and, 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 and a variety of actuation. So all this combines to make this enormous amount of uncertainty at the end effector, at the, at, the, at the hand of the robot. And a very small error, sub-millimeter error, can cause a difference between holding something securely and lifting it and dropping that object. So this is an ongoing challenge. It's a grand challenge for robotics. And my students and I have been looking at it for, well, I like to say I've been studying it for 35 years, and we've made remarkably little progress. But in the last few years, there's been a very nice set of developments and largely coming out of the field of, of computer vision that has adopted deep learning. And it was the availability of very large labeled sets of data that led to the breakthrough that we know, know today as contemporary deep learning and artificial intelligence. And the question my students and I started to ask is, could we do something analogous to what was done in vision in the realm of robotics? In other words, could we assemble a very large data set? And here, this is what we call, instead of ImageNet, we call it DexNet. And the idea is not to um, assemble a large a data set of images, but a, a large data set of three-dimensional models and label them not with the names of the objects, but in this case with the grasps. That would be robust grasps for these objects. And if we could label that, could we start to learn from that very large data set in a way that we could generalize to new objects in the same way that ImageNet was able to generalize, uh, the system was able to generalize to new images. So here's the analogy again, is that computer vision has had a major breakthrough when it reached a critical mass in a number of images. Could we possibly reach something similar in the realm of robotics where we reach a critical mass in a number of three-dimensional models and grasps? So we built this, we built a system called Dexterity Network, and we've been collecting objects, three-dimensional models from all over, all over the internet, carefully uh, rescaling them, cleaning them up so that they're, air, they're watertight and have nice clean properties. And then what we're doing in our DexNet system is essentially doing a uh, Monte Carlo integration over the uncertainty in the pose of the, of the robot gripper, that's an uncertainty in, in, in uh, control, and perception, and also uncertainty in the shape. So we have, we treat all of these elements as random variables, and then we consider perturbations. We sample from these distributions to estimate what is the probability that a particular grasp will succeed or not. So we can do that in simulation, which uh, someone recently said is, is like uh, having the robot dreaming about picking up objects all night long. And basically that's, that's really a good analogy because it sort of happens. The robot just, basically does a huge number of experiments in simulation. And this, this computation, by the way, is non-trivial. If you think about each object you would consider has about a thousand facets, little, little, little faces. And then uh, a grip or a grasp on an object is, two, is, a, is a contact with two of those faces. So every pair of faces is a potential grasp. So that means that you have a million ways to grasp a given object. And then you're gonna look at perturbations for each of that, that particular pair of faces or that grasp, and that's gonna get you a, you're up into now a billion grasp evaluations per object. And now if you have tens of thousands of objects, well, you're talking very quickly, you're very large computations. So we've been doing this in a distributed way over the, over the web and over the, uh, over the cloud. And I'll come back to this. And one thing we're also doing is also sampling in basically noise, injecting noise into our models of the sensors as well. So LIDAR sensors, depth sensors are very, very effective nowadays are getting better. As many of you know, uh, RealSense from Intel, there's a number of vendors out there. The, the resolution is increasing, the, the, the frame rate is increasing, the price is dropping. So this is really changing the field, but these things are not perfect. They have they're prone to errors due to specularities and transparencies in objects. So we inject noise and we come up with a very large set of examples. That is, Y is an image, U is a grasp, and R is our estimate of the probability of success of that grasp. So we have on the order of six million examples and then both positive and negative examples of, of grasps. And then we use that to train a deep neural network. So we want to 
basically find the set of weights, theta, theta is a vector of weights, the set that minimizes the loss uh, between the, the predicted and, the, and what we know as ground truth that we gave it the, the demonstrations. And now, then we want to use that to find a grasp that optimizes the quality, of the, pro the probability of success. And this network, the resulting network, once it's trained, is called the grasp quality CNN. And this was developed primarily by my PhD student, Jeff uh, Mahler, and a number of other students in the lab. This has, um, has proven surprisingly effective. So we give it a new LiDAR image, again, something that's never seen before, run it through the network, and it gives us the probability of success for that grasp. And then we do that for many, many different candidate grasps, and we then execute the best grasp. So the system is then generalized to bins of objects that could, um, we trained it again with, uh, with large synthetic bins of objects. And this is, shows an example of the evolution in real time. What happens is that we take an image, uh, you see the, the RGB image on the left, the depth image uh, to next, and then it very systematically using cross entropy reduces the number of grasps down to what it considers the optimal grasp and then it executes that. So here's the system running on very novel objects. These are objects that it's never been trained on, never seen before, and it is, we found it to be remarkably successful at cleaning, clearing bins like this over and over again. We would just dump in objects, things we found in in garages and various <laughs> corners of the lab and just throw almost anything in there. And it was able to, um, to find a grasp and, and pick it up. And when we started showing this to some, some colleagues in industry, they were really excited about this. And they said, this is a problem that we, we really want to solve. And but they said, but could, you know, we use suction cups. And suction cups are interesting because the grasps that we were considering are with a gripper. And that means two points of contact. A suction cup has a single point of contact. But we realized that we could actually take the very same framework and apply it to suction cup models. So we went to look at what is the, the theoretical model of suction cups, and it turns out there wasn't a really a, there wasn't much literature on this. So we developed our own. We worked out this is uh, Matt Maddle worked out this very nice, elegant model of a suction cup in terms of the the seal of the suction and the 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 the, the, the wrench mechanics of how it would could resist forces and torques. And then we would basically use that in the Monte Carlo in integration to find the probability of success for suction cups. And you see here on the right that basically this is what it's found is the green are the more, the, the points on that object, that strange looking object that have a higher probability of success. And we could do this very quickly for a bin as well. So the system can, can take a depth image and compute this very fast. And you can see here that the green are where it's recommending that, that the suction cup be placed. Now, once we had that, we have ability to handle both suction cup grasping and parallel jaw grasping. So we decided to put those together. And we had a system that we call ambidextrous. We have both modalities together. And we were trained both of these networks. We had to put them into a, a common framework so that they were, um, were comparing apples to apples. And so what we want to do now is find which modality for which grasp has the highest probability of success, whether the gripper or the suction. And then we put those together. We now have an ambidextrous system. So the system is constantly looking at the bin, trying to determine which, which modality, the suction or the gripper, will be most likely to, to be able to pick up the next object. And so this is able to do even better than the earlier versions that we were developing. So this is, um, this is reported. If you want to find out more about it, it's in um, our lab website has links to this paper, but there's a number of other papers that have extended this in, in, in different ways. I also want to say that we started a company Jeff and Matt and a number of other students have started ambidextrous uh, laboratories, which is um, located in, in Berkeley, California, and it is growing. It's doing very well. If you're interested in that, please get in touch with me. Our motto is uh, getting a grip on reality. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence more broadly. And I want to say that one thing I'm very interested in right now is the is is, is not only artificial intelligence, but also what's sometimes known as intelligence amplification. That means amplifying human abilities using new technologies. So the word I have for this is complementarity, that what humans are, are, are humans and robots are complementary. And some of you may recognize this from Star, the old original Star Wars series. Spock in some way was like a robot. He was um, all about logic. And Kirk was all about empathy and about intuition. 
And um, this is really a really nice, I, I believe, very nice analogy for the interactions between, between robots and humans. I don't think it's a matter of, of us versus them, that they're going to take over the world. But actually, the real potential is for us to work together. Now, robots are very good at calculations, objectivity. But as we've seen, they're not very good at dexterity, being able to pick up and manipulate objects, or empathy, or understanding of human motives and psychology. Now, one thing I want to mention to you in the context of diversity here is that I also think there's an opportunity that we can start thinking about these new categories of, of robots and AI and a way that we can learn a lesson from, from, from the, the systems that have been developed in the past in terms of the power of diversity. And here's the example. You, many of you know about decision trees. It's one of the first things you learn about when you study artificial intelligence. It's a very effective way of classifying data. And about 20 years ago, two wonderful colleagues at Berkeley um, developed a, 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 a version of the decision tree. And their insight was rather than just having one tree, they would have a set of trees. And they called that a random forest. And the idea is that what you do is you train a number of trees, but you train them slightly differently. It's slight variations on the, on, the, on the parameters of the tree so that they each learn a slightly different classification. But then when you give it a new example, basically take all those trees and effectively average them together to come up with a prediction. And the amazing thing about this was they were able to prove that the ensemble, the, the, the random forest, will always be better than the individual tree if, if the, the trees are sufficiently diverse. So this is a very important part, but there's, a, there's an element of of, of diversity that if the trees are homogeneous, you don't get the effect, but if the trees are diverse, sufficiently diverse, you get a, a, a bound, on, a, a, a very nice bound on their performance. And that is a way of saying that, that diversity is very powerful, that we can gain tremendously. This is a, a formal proof in this case, that diversity can be beneficial. Now it's been shown recently that this is also true for human groups. And I believe this very wholeheartedly that humans, when groups of humans are diverse, they will come up with better ideas, better innovations, better solutions to problems than a group that's very homogeneous. Because a group that's homogeneous, who all say studied the same textbook and went to the same type of schools, will be thinking along similar lines and they'll get stuck in local minima, they, an echo chamber, if you will. But when you have a diverse group, you have someone who's thinking outside the box, that tends to dislodge that kind of, um, that kind of echo chamber or local minima and get them to a to, or, or local maxima and gets them to a global maxima. So I'm very much supportive of this idea of diversity as a, as, a, as a force that we can use in the future generations of systems, that we can use them to enhance our own ability to work together and our ability to work with machines. And by the way, I think that, that we should start thinking of, of AI and robots essentially as another type of diversity. They are, they are a particular strength, they have, they have a skill sets, but they're not, they can't do everything. So rather than seeing them as something that we fear that's gonna take over, we should start thinking of them as something that can be very effective partners. Now, I also think this is gonna change the way we teach. It's already happening now in the pandemic because there's been so much innovation happening because of distance learning. But learning in the past and in, in, in so much of the, the last century has been about conformity. Getting to school, sitting, sitting down, um, you know, being uniform, obedient, and, and it's fairly rigid type of learning. But the future, it's like these, these this team of, of young women from Afghanistan who came to the US to, to compete in a robotics competition. This is the future. It's about diversity. It's about collaboration. It's about innovation. It's about trying new things, working together in teams. Now, I think this is really interesting also in the, in the realm of robotics. And I wrote an article that came out in, in Nature Machine Intelligence recently that basically said that I see a return to collaborative intelligence in the realm of robotics. And it's really being, being accelerated by four different aspects. One, of course, is deep learning, that the, the new era, the, the new wave in deep learning has opened up many new possibilities of, of, of new systems and allowed systems to work together in new ways. The second is human robot interaction, HRI, is, is experiencing a huge uh, explosion and expansion. And many, many young researchers are making real powerful advances in, in the understanding of how robots should be designed with humans in mind, human interactions in mind. The third is a new generation of collaborative robots. And many of you have seen these kind of robots around. Many companies are making them now. And these are robots that are designed to be 
safe for humans to work side by side. So in the old era, robots were very scary. They had, they were very dangerous. Many of those still exist by the way, but they have to be basically kept in cages because if a human would accidentally walk into their workspace, the human could be injured or even killed. But this class of robots are safe. They're inherently safe. They're made to, 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 to stop when they make uh, contact and never move that fast that they can have the inertial forces to really do damage to a human. And this has become very popular because these kind of robots can be used in laboratories, in warehouses and factories, because side by side with human workers. And the last one, a new element I see is what, what my students and I are calling fog robotics. And fog is like cloud robotics, but taken to another level where we're recognizing that all the computation doesn't happen all in the cloud or all on the edge. The computation is distributed between the cloud and the edge, and that's where we get the idea of fog. Um, we like that here in the Bay Area, but it's idea that we need to do load balancing. We need to have a distributed system with a number of security features and backup features, and basically making use of moving the computation to where it can be most effective. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, uh, um, I'm, well I'm gonna zoom ahead and I will come back to this actually because I wanted to to share with you just a couple of brand new projects that are really just hot off the presses and then we'll come back and I'll take questions from you. So let me um, do this. Uh, I'm gonna pull over to another screen and I'm gonna show you just for a few minutes. These are some slides of a paper that will be presented tomorrow and or Monday in the Conference on Robot Learning. And this is work that's being done by two amazing uh, young women in my lab, Jennifer Granin and Priya Sundarisen. And what they've been studying is the ability of robots to untangle knots. And you can imagine this is very useful for a variety of applications. They're looking at things like, you know, cleaning up around homes, possibly being used in surgical applications where knots have to be, have to be tied and untied. Um, it's useful in manufacturing and assembly, of course, on ships. Uh, so there's many different cases where knots are, are, are present. And we have to, and, and surprisingly, there's been very little work on robots, the ability of robots to untie knots. So what we've been doing is training a robot by examples to learn how to untangle knots. And so we give it a lot of examples. And we, the, the challenge is that, that rope or, or cables are very high dimensional. There's a, you know, there's a, you have a, a, a length of material, but it can take on an infinite number of states. And also the length of the material, they generally, it looks the same all along the length. So there's not clear features in that object in the rope or cable to identify. So we have to be able to cope with those, those challenges. And in addition, there's very, the, to be able to pull apart these knots, you have to reach into very, very small gaps between the material. So there's a lot of, to say here, I'm not going to do justice to their wonderful work, but you can look it up and um, it'll be in the conference tomorrow, the, or sorry, on Monday. But um, I just want to give you a little, a couple images of the, from their talk, which is that we are particularly looking at dense knots, as you see on the far right here. These are knots that are, that don't have any space between the, between the material. And some other conditions, like they're semi-planar, Etc. But the idea is to come up with a sequence of pin and pull operations that will pull the knot loose and, and remove it. So I'm just going to um, skip over this a little bit. This is how they basically in simulation generate knots by taking a piece of, um, of synthetic rope and tying a knot in it and then dropping it onto workspace. And that becomes a starting point for a training for, for as a demonstration. And they can do this because in the simulator, we know exactly where the all the, the, the rope is and the cable is. And so we know where the key points are. And then we can use that to essentially what we call an algorithmic, an algorithmic demonstrator, sorry, algorithmic supervisor. It's a system that can automatically show itself how to untangle knots. And so it's doing that here. It's doing it uh, of these, these moves. There's two moves that are known in knot theory is Rademeister moves and no deletion moves. And you do a sequence of these um, to until there's no more knots in the rope. So um, here's, I'll show you, this is a, what I really like is there, is there real images that were taken in the lab. Very recently, as you can see here, the Rademeister is pulling the two ends of the, of the cable apart and no deletion is where you reach in. You pin down one part and you pull with another, with the second jaw and you separate the, um, the pieces so you essentially 
delete a node in a network representation of the of the knot. And so you can see that this has been successful at, um, at untangling knots. We've been training it in simulation, comparing different versions of the algorithm. And they've been doing a fantastic job. This has been really a tremendous uh, project that uh, one of Jennifer's an undergraduate and Priya is a master's student. And this paper was selected as one of 20, 20 papers to be presented in the oral part of the, of the very prestigious conference on robot learning so on Monday. So we can, you can find out more about this and get copies of our paper when, um, from the website. And then the other project I want to show you very quickly is something also kind of fun and exciting, also dealing with rope, but in a very different way. This is, um, we call it Robots of the Lost Ark. And the idea here, we were inspired by, uh, you may have seen um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, a uh, great movie. And it was, um, and the uh, idea was the ability to control a whipping motion. So we are now using a robot to um, control a cable, and we wanted to do certain tasks. So here's an example of the cable in action. Um, this is uh, this is a robot, a UR5, and it's basically being able to um, what we're calling here is vaulting. It's being able to move it over a potential obstacle. So there's a lot of interesting work here. We've been drawing on the three tasks we've been looking at is vaulting on the left reaching over, taking the cable over an obstacle. Second is knocking. When we have an object on an obstacle, we want to knock that object off. And the third is what we call weaving, where you want to weave the cable in between the, um, the obstacles. So I won't go again into detail. We've been experimenting with an algorithm here and, um, and optimizing the, the apex point of the algorithm so that we can achieve these tasks. We run it, it's, it's, it's a form of self-supervised because it, one end of the cable is attached to the wall. Uh, it's plugged in essentially, and then the, the, um, the so the robot can reset and try it over, try different strategies um, over and over again on, without supervision. So I'm just going to quickly go through this, but here's a demo. This is consulting. Um, show you uh, another demo. Here it is with the closer in obstacle. I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to do one, a couple more of these. This is a uh, knocking, and here's another one knocking this uh, ball off. And then here's a demo of the weaving. And this paper is actually being reviewed for a conference on um, the IEEE conference on robotics and automation. So it's not public yet, but we are willing to share it and it's available also on the website. So um, let's see, one more shot of this weaving. Good, okay. So I'm just gonna come back here and I'll be happy to take questions um, if you have them. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, so thank you so much for the talk, Mr. Goldberg. It was really innovating, and me as well as everyone who tuned in learned a lot of new things. So yeah, as you said, let's get into the question portion. So we have uh, some pre-submitted questions, so I'll go over one or two of those, and then we'll get okay. into the questions from the audience, if that's okay with Great. you. Okay. Great. Yeah, so here's a question. Uh, I'm a beginner in AI and programming in general. What started your interest in programming and robotics? Ah, okay, great question. So I got interested in programming when I was a kid. My dad actually had was an engineer and he had a small company that he was um, doing chrome plating. And that involved lifting um, basically pieces of metal and drip, dipping them into tanks, some of which tanks were, were very um, poisonous chemicals like cyanide. And so he came up with the idea, and this was in the 70s, of, um, of, of building a robot to do this task. And so at that time, the, the technology was very primitive. We just had these stepper motors. And um, we, but I learned how to, how to program a binary circuit when I was about 10 years old. And I got very excited about this. My dad and I always talked about it. And we were never able to get it to work, but it got me inspired. And then years later, I think it was partly also because I was interested in go-karts and model rockets and building, building um, all kinds of models when I was a kid. But that I, I loved the idea of something that would be physical, but also computational. And this idea of, of, of building something that you could combine the ideas of, of physics and mechanics with ideas from, from computation and math always appealed to me. And I still, to this day, get a huge kick out of it. Every time I see a robot doing something, it, it's just, um, there's nothing like it. Uh, it's very inspiring. And I'm also very excited about its potential for training students at all ages. So we actually have a book 
that is out called um, How to Train Your Robot. And it's aimed at, at, at fourth and fifth year old girls primarily, but for anyone can read it. And um, it's also free available from download on our website. Yeah, wow, that's really cool that you were able to learn some, uh, stuff as a kid and that got you interested into your career in robotics. Mm. Uh, another pre-submitted question we have is this. So as a professional programmer and coder, you've worked in many groups. What are some good qualities to programmers who work in a team need to have? Oh, great. Okay, well, I would say, you know, I, I, I have to, again, say my, my experience is based on the students that I've been fortunate to work with. And a couple of things we look for. One is real passion. So a student who really loves to, 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 to loves the subject and is really excited about it, who, you know, it's not just something they want to put on the resume, okay? It's something that they really want to play with and really want to understand. Number two, it's a, it's a fair amount of discipline because the passion is great, but you also have to be willing to do the work. And that means the ability to do well in your classes, do, and keep up with all of that as well as take on research. And so that requires some discipline because you have to, sometimes it means saying, I'm not gonna go out to the, you know, go out to watch a movie or play games or do other things when it means you gotta get work done. And the third quality that I really like is, is, is really important is the, um, is, is the ability to, is, is a certain kind of modesty. That some students, um, I find that the characteristic that really stands out among my best students is a real modesty. They really are not, you know, huge egos. They're really open to being what I call coachable. And uh, this is a, a term they all know. I, I use it all the time. My daughters even, uh, we talk about being coachable. And it's an idea that it's really important to listen and take advice, take it in, ask for it, even seek out advice. And like you're doing today, like that question is a, a good example of, of, of something I, I, I find is being coachable. And that means not being a big ego, not saying, not being a no at all, but instead always being open to learning more, learning a new way of doing something. So that's a huge, huge and valuable thing. And the last one is generosity, which is about being generous to other students and to other others, collaborators and others around you. I find this also stands out in my, my best students. They're very generous. They're willing to help each other out. They're willing to help others. They really have this like intrinsic aspect of like, they want to share their, their good fortune, their skills with other people. So all those things put together really is, is, is a combination of skills. And it's about really being like a great citizen. And that is going to take you so far. You know, it is, it's an amazing thing that if you, if you work hard, if you're passionate, if you just look around at this, the scene here is a perfect example of students and they're just engrossed in what they're doing. They love it. This is, uh, this is I think it shot earlier in the day, but they were up to well past midnight working together on uh, finishing a paper for a deadline. So those kind of qualities, that kind of team camaraderie is really terrific. And that's, that's what I try and cultivate in my lab. And I see it uh, among the best students of, of the new generation. Yeah, so hopefully everyone who's tuning in, you guys wrote that down so that when you guys are working in your <laughs> groups, you can kind of instill those traits into yourself and into those working with you so you could have a good hackathon project. So let's get into mm -hmm. the questions from the chat. Okay. How does the robot approach the weaving problem? Additionally, how does it determine the optimal trajectory of force to do the knocking function? Does it factor in the attributes of the target object? Great. Yes, it does. So one of the ideas is that this is, a, this is actually an undergraduate project. Harry Zhang led this project in the, in the writing of the paper. Uh, I was hoping he might be able to join us today, but he's, he's fantastic. He, um, he's basically the idea is that he starts with an image. So the robot takes an image of the scene. So it, it, it uses that, it processes that uh, essentially to, and it's a, it's a deep learning system. So it, it basically transforms that into a, an estimate of a, an apex position for the, the height, the peak point of the arm trajectory. And then what it does is it starts to uh, experiment with that because what it's trying to do is adjust it to hit the target. That's to vault over the target or to hit the obstacle or to weave in between obstacles. So as you can imagine, that is, is impossible to always get that right the first time. So it sometimes takes multiple trials. But what's been surprising to us is how repeatable it is. Once you get it right, it tends to be repeatable. You can do it over and over again, at least for this combination of scenarios. Now, what we'd like to be able to do is to, is to generalize as, we're, as we did with grasping 
so that we could now give it a very different scenario, right? A very different set of obstacles and, and scenes and have it basically work out what to do there. That's not so clear yet. So we, we were, we're, this is very much a work in progress, but we're very excited about this as a new, a new set of tasks for robots to do. And there's a lot of new open questions about how to do those more and more effectively. Okay. Um, another question in the chat we have is, how much environmental data does the robot need in order to achieve some of the more complicated tasks, such as whipping or weaving? In whipping and weaving, it doesn't need very much, no, because also essentially remember the, the two things. One is that the, the cable is plugged in at the opposite end. That's a huge constraint, by the way, because if you take that away, then I think it's very hard to essentially reset the cable, get back to a similar state. But if you have the cable plugged in, one thing we don't show there is that what we do at the beginning is we pull the cable almost taut, with, so it's pulled almost straight, and then we let gradually put it down on the ground. So we, we start out with a very similar initial state. Then the other thing, only thing we get is the, is the image, as I mentioned, which has the placement of the obstacles and or the, the target that we want to knock off the obstacle. And so that's the only input. So the system is essentially indexing where it's learned in the past. It uses that to get close, and then it interpolates to actually until it actually is able to succeed. Okay. Um, another question from the chat is, I'm a beginner in AI. Could you give me some tips on how to start? Ah, okay. So great question. I mean, I'm, I, I think we're very fortunate, or you're very fortunate right now, because there are a lot of great resources out there online. And the first place I would do, I would start is, is reading up everything, reading things that are aimed toward your, toward your age and skill level. So if you're in high school, and you, there are certain introductory uh, papers, there's interviews that talk about um, how to get started with artificial intelligence. There's one book I really like that is um, that is um, Melanie, where is it? I have it here. <clears throat> I have to pull it up. Uh, Melanie Mitchell. It's, um, it's a book, um, um, Understanding to a Guide to Robots. Wait a second. You're gonna have to dig it up. Oh, well, um, I can die to understanding robots, I believe. Anyway, it's a great introduction. Um, and I will, I will, in fact, if you email me or something, I'll put that on my Twitter. Uh, I'll tweet out the, the exact reference right after this. But it's a really readable introduction that's very smart. She's a, she's a professor of robotics, but it's aimed to the general audience, but it's not, not oversimplified. It's very, very well explained where she talks about deep learning, she talks about reinforcement learning, she talks about robotics, and she also is very clear-eyed about the limitations of a number of the current methods. So she is a great place to start, and you can just pick up that book and read it. If you want to get further into it, there's a number of online courses. As you probably know, Andrew Ng's course on Coursera, there's, uh, there's a number of, of great um, things you can pick up to start to learn and get some exposure. Uh, you can even start to play with things like PyTorch and, um, uh, and, and, and TensorFlow, uh, essentially tutorials. And there is just a huge number of things to, to, to learn from. I would say the, the key is don't only take the, the, the things that everybody else is taking. Try and find some more obscure um, descriptions or tutorials because it's really good that you learn slightly differently than everybody else. I think this is very important. It comes back to diversity. We talked about earlier that uh, you know, there's a lot of sense today that with with online courses that everybody can learn from, you know, one guru and learn, you know, take that course and know about deep learning. I think there's a danger to that because, yes, everybody can take it. And it's probably a great course, but then everybody's going to have the same, basically learn the same biases. And so I, I think that can be dangerous because later as as research goes on, everybody's coming from the same place. That's not actually the best way to innovate. So what's better is to, for you to explore, find somebody, let's say from your, and speaks in your own language, maybe even a friend, someone you may know, a friend of a friend who's in college, who's studying these things, and just you know, ask them for some advice, Get start to talk to them. Learn your own way, that's very important because I want everyone to come to these things in, with a new set of skills and a new set of perspectives because then when you get into research or into a job where you're using this, you'll have a, a unique perspective. And that's very important. I think it's really important when learning how to program. Same thing. Everybody shouldn't be taking exactly the same Python introductory course, but learn from in different ways. 
And that's going to give us the diversity in thinking, cognitive diversity, that we're going to need to make the, make the breakthroughs for the next generation. All right, yeah. So being respectful of your time, let's do one last question from the chat, and okay. then I think we'll wrap it up. OK. OK. So let me see. A moment. Yeah. I thought your comment about the general fear of an AI takeover was pretty interesting. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Oh, absolutely. So I, I, I actually, this is a, a real pet, pet uh, topic for me because I think that there is a huge amount of fear out there and exaggeration that AI is going to essentially um, surpass humans. And it goes under a variety of names. Some say singularity, some say super intelligence. And you, you know who's been saying these kinds of things. And they're usually very smart people, um, you know, um, who, who are, uh, you know, extremely respected for their intelligence. However, they're not often the experts in artificial intelligence who are saying this. So I think that those who are working in the field of artificial intelligence are almost unanimous in feeling that the the that there's no danger of robots and, and AI taking over humans. The, the robots and AI are very good at doing certain things, as I mentioned earlier, like calculations, even playing certain kinds of games. As we know, there's been a beautiful breakthroughs in the game of Go recently, as well as, as many other games. But I think that it's really important to understand that some many, many problems are so nuanced and complex that we actually need the human intuition as part of the process. And so that, for example, the virus that we're fighting right now and understanding that virus brings together many different kinds of human minds to try and wrestle with this incredible complexity of the system. It's been interesting that no AI system has made a, a major contribution to understanding or combating uh, COVID-19. So I think putting it into context is very important. There have been steady progress and there is, is really impressive, but AI is, 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 is impressive, but it's not, it's nowhere near, it doesn't nearly have the capacity of the human mind to be able to put things into context, to understand the, the, the nuance of, the, of, of, the, of, of difference between things. And so this is, a, this is really, I can spend another hour or two talking about this and I would love to, but, um, but suffice to say, I'm really much in the camp of saying that AI is nothing to fear. Although I do think there's certain areas we should be on guard against its potential for um, suppressing um, its surveillance and uh, suppressing privacy. But I think that in terms of it taking over and surpassing us as humans, I'm not worried about that. For example, I don't think we're gonna see self-driving cars in cities or in even suburbs for, for, for a very long time, for decades. I think that's a very, very hard problem, deceptively hard. But I do think we're gonna see robots in warehouses because there, if you make a mistake, it's not like you drive off a cliff or you hit somebody on a bicycle. There, if you, hit, if you make a mistake, you drop the object and that's not the end of the world. So I think we're getting closer to that. But I'm, it's just a very, very rich and complex subject. I'm, the fact that you're here on a Saturday is, uh, is very impressive. That shows that you're, you've got that instinct and passion that I talked about earlier. So I am really confident. And by the way, my students, I've watched over the last 20 years, are getting smarter and smarter. And this is, gives me a huge amount of confidence because I feel like we are on a trajectory to getting better in this world. I know that politics don't necessarily look that way, but I think that we are, as a species, getting better. And that I have a huge amount of confidence and excitement about. All right, yeah. So thank you so much for your uh, speech in AMA. And everyone who's tuned in, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you're interested on more, uh, CMU professor Po Shen Lo is presenting his story right now. So you can go ahead and check that out. Everyone, make sure to follow Ken Goldberg on his Twitter and follow Def Hacks on all of their social medias. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you again, Mr. Goldberg. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Take care. Take care. Bye. All right, let's go to the other one.